and just transition to a renewable future. Um, I'm part of the Metro Climate Action Team, which is associated with Oregon League of Conservation Voters, and also following very closely the governor's executive order and hoping for good funding for the agencies that we're depending on for that. So I look forward to hearing your views on climate and how that fits in with your priorities this morning. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Bobby Bird, you're next on my screen. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. My name is Bobby Bird. I work for United Oregon. Uh, I'm a community, community organizer for United Oregon and I, uh, my, my counties are Washington County and um, Multnomah County. And the reason I'm here is I'm here to uh, support Measure 110 and uh, imp imp the implementation of Measure 110. Great, thank you so much for being here. Um, Michael Mitten. Good morning, Representative Dexter. My name is Michael Mitten. Uh, I'm also with the OLCV's Metro Climate Action Team and uh, very interested in anything you have to say about the climate legislation that's working its way through uh, right now. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, lots of thoughts there. Happy to discuss that for sure this morning. And Mary Galvin, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm really impressed with the group we have on here today and looking forward to your questions and learning from all of you. Uh, my main reason for reaching out to Maxine, and thank you, Maxine, uh, was to really understand more about the whole vaccine distribution, decision making, and what's going on there. Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about that, so we will talk about it. All right, and Frank. Thank you. Yeah, and tell me how to say your name appropriately, please. Frank? Yeah. Let me, okay. Yeah, Frank, Frank. Frank Clark, yeah. Oh, I had it close, good. Yeah, <laughs> I was born in, uh, in Europe, so I apologize for my accent. Um, and I want to thank you for uh, doing this. It's wonderful. And my uh, major interest is in uh, environment. Thank Hello. you. Yeah, thank you. Please don't ever apologize for an accent. <laughs> glad to have you. Um, Jennifer Saunders, good morning. Sorry, I was still muted. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm a constituent neighbor and um, interest in all of the above, and particularly environment issues. Wonderful, thank you. Bill Goldsmith, it's good to see you. Good morning. Good morning, Representative Dexter. Um, so I uh, live in the Alphabet District and I'm particularly interested in racial justice issues. Wonderful. I will definitely touch on that this morning too. Good morning, Jerry. It's good to see you. You were able to get on this morning. You're still on mute, my friend. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> good morning. Go. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. good. So I'm a constituent and, um, you know, pretty much mostly interested in public health and childhood issues, school issues. Wonderful. We'll talk about it. All right. Good morning. I'm lovely. Oh, you're still on mute too, friend. <laughs> Sorry. You would think at this point, but um, yeah, I am Emerson Levy and I actually live out in Central Oregon, but I have a Republican uh, uh, representative. So I go to other people's town halls to find out what's going on. <laughs> So. And thank you for running. It's really good to see you. Nice yeah. to see you too. Thanks we'll for doing hopefully get to be colleagues here someday. Um, Marie Fisher, are you are you there? And if you're not, it's I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm cooking breakfast, so I apologize for not being on camera. I'm a resident of the Parole District, and um, I completely agree with all of the topics that have been raised thus far. And the only one I would add is the homeless crisis here in Northwest. Great. Yes, we will, we will touch on that too. And Kate, it's good to see you. Kate is one of the amazing uh, staff members on my team uh, and also a constituent. So it's great to have you, Kate. <laughs> Thank you, good morning. Good morning. And Vesna, Vesna Yovanovic, uh, one of my uh, colleagues at Northwest Perm and really, really strong advocate. Uh, you wanna say hi, Vesna? Sure, good morning. You're not my constituent, but you know, I, I want to hear. I want to hear it straight from. You're not a horse, but the horse's mouth of what's going down in Salem. 
All right. Thank you. It's good to see you. Um, all right. So I'm really appreciative of everyone who's here. I don't think that I've missed anyone. So this is fantastic. I can see everyone on a screen. Um, so I will just kind of start out with um, a couple of the things that each of you has um, brought up. So first on redistricting, because that, um, that committee is obviously top of mind for a lot of us. Um, Andrea Salinas is uh, chairing that committee and is an extremely experienced and um, very thoughtful leader. And unfortunately, what we have found is that the US Census Bureau information is not going to be um, likely ready until July 30th. And I believe the date is July 7th that the Oregon legislature is supposed to have completed the redistricting um, uh, uh, process. So clearly it's not gonna work on that timeline. The Secretary of State theoretically by the constitution has until August 15th. So even she would only have about two weeks from the projected date of census um, return of information to draw lines. Um, we know that there's been a lot of change in House District 33, uh, lots of folks moving out um, of the city to the suburbs. So House District 30 and 33 in the metro area are two of the fastest growing districts, and or at least we think they are, we'll see. And then uh, House District 54, which is the Bend area, is also projected to have mm -hmm. quite a bit of difference. You know, the most important thing to a lot of us is that we are projected to get a sixth con congressional seat. And so how those lines are drawn and, and how people can start running for that seat is really um, an important consideration with all of this. So, um, you know, Chris, I, I don't have a lot more insight into that. The um, Supreme Court here in Oregon is looking at whether some of these um, statutorily protected dates can be moved. And that's going to be a, a significant issue. So none of us are surprised by this who were paying attention, I think, you know, the COVID created a huge um, burden of um, challenge for our census committees. And we'll just have to roll with it like we have with everything else with COVID. But I think anytime something this important is put on a short timeline, we have to be really concerned about process and whether there is appropriate accountability and engagement. And it's going to be really tough. But I think if anyone's up to it, um, Andrea Salinas is one of those folks. Um, so as far as um, Let's just quickly touch on the environmental stuff because we do have several of you from our, our League of Conservation Voters and whatnot. Um, we have several bills ourselves that we are sponsoring this session. That being said, the extended producer responsibility bill, um, there's two of them, one being sponsored by Janine Salmon, which is a bit more robust than the one that the governor is sponsoring um, that is actually the result of about a two and a half year process with um, DEQ. And that one is um, has lots of stakeholders and what it is is really trying to shift plastics out of um, utilization as it is currently. So putting um, responsibility on the producers of plastics uh, for the disposal of plastics. And we have precedent for this with things like the mattress tax um, or mattress fee that there's a disposal fee that producers pay for the mattress after it lives its life because it basically goes to landfills. And so what we're doing is shifting that upstream um, with higher costs for producing plastics. Um, and that will over time, hopefully incentivize sustainable uh, materials being used. There will also be a truth and labeling more or less component of this. So the, the chasing arrows, three triangular symbol that a lot of us are used to looking at, and I don't know about you, but not necessarily knowing um, what each number means and which ones are recyclable in Oregon um, or in my local utility district is um, a, a problem for a lot of us. And so there will be a statewide list of what is recyclable and they will only be able to use recyclable um, printing on any um, product or package if it indeed is on that list for Oregon. There are some interstate questions about that. Certainly not all packaging is made in Oregon to be disposed of in Oregon. And so um, there's interstate commerce laws that are being kind of considered with this. And so there's um, some ongoing uh, work on that. And I do have three plastics bills, but 
I honestly believe that these EPR bills are more um, comprehensive and a, a better policy aim. So um, my truth and labeling uh, bill is not one that we are trying to promote over that. That would be if we can't get the larger omnibus bill um, passed, then we might go to that one. And, and Paul Ho Holvey and multiple other people have a very similar one. So we're not sure where that's going to go. Um, in addition, there's the 100% uh, sustainable uh, or renewable energy bill that CONFAM and um, Lauren, remind me who else is sponsoring that, um, if you know offhand, or Kate, anyway. Um, it's a huge, uh, it, that's the major, I think that's the pinnacle policy that we're really trying to get past. And it's really investing in the infrastructure in Oregon to move us to 100% renewable energy. And then there's um, significant environmental bill or electric vehicle bills as well, trying to um, improve the access of charging stations, decrease the, um, the cost of charging, and also in, uh, sustain the uh, reimbursement so that, you know, middle class, you know, working class, even hopefully um, folks can afford to buy an electronic or electric uh, vehicle. Any other major bills, Linda or Michael, that you were thinking of that you wanted us to talk about or anyone else? You can just shoot. Uh, no, that did cover it. The, uh, the other sponsors on the 100% clean energy are uh, Representative uh, Marsh and Representative Power. That's right. And of course, I should have known. So um, Representative Marsh is the chair now of the um, e, e committee, the Energy and Environment, right. and Karn Power was the prior. So this is, right. they've been working on this um, policy for quite a while. So, um, and Khan has been organizing around this um, before she was a representative and was clearly working in this space for a long time. So um, she, I'm very fortunate to have as a colleague and we will work together. Um, you know, we're meeting every other week to kind of put our heads together and make sure that we're moving these things forward as well as we can. So lots of energy on um, these energy bills. So- hey, Representative. Please. Could you could you mention the bill number, please, on the plastics bill that you were thinking is the strong one? So 2065 is the governor's bill. And I don't know. And I think that that's really the one that the majority of the push is around. So it's HB 2065. Um, and, you know, not to say that Solomon's bill isn't... Um, a good one. It's a stronger bill. It puts all of the producer responsibility for plastics on the producers, uh, or sorry, all the responsibility cost-wise for um, disposal on the producers. But um, because this other one has been in negotiations for so long and industry is already on board, I suspect that that's the one that's going to get the support. Um, and this may be a hard year to get uh, some of these policies passed because a lot of it depended on relationship building and, and communication in the building. And this is really hard right now because we're all, you know, making appointments and don't really run into each other in any way. So we'll see how this goes. Um, to get to some of the racial justice, I, I, that is top of mind for me. Um, not that any of these other things aren't, but I've been um, very fortunate to have been put on the or on the equitable policing subcommittee of our judiciary committee that I also serve on, and um, working with Rep. Salman. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Janine and Janelle uh, always talk about how it's really frustrating that they get interchanged because of their names. So, um, <laughs> so Rep. Bynum, and it's nothing to do with her last name, obviously, um, has been an amazing chair and an, a really strong advocate for this. So we have um, already taken on some pretty significant policies, including data registry for use of force um, for our police. Um, we have talked about um, youth detention and in relation to um, overruling some of the, the sentencing, um, the Measure 11 related sentencing that had been overturned last year or had been reversed. And so now trying to get through um, these cases and, and we have some youth who aren't even charged and, and gone to trial for over a year sitting in, in detention centers that aren't meant to support their learning needs or any of their 
um, really developmental needs that teenagers and, and young people are, are needing. So that was um, a top of mind one, this last one. And then we, we discussed um, and we'll come back to uh, the chemical, uh, sorry, I'm trying to remember the exact bill. Um, so it's, it's tear gas, but all chemicals, um, gases and and then also the sound um oh my gosh fesna what's the the acronym that everyone flash bangs thank you oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'm obviously trying to think we forget it. how how did we forget that i know so yeah fesna and i spent a lot of time at um different blm um events and and she lives close to a place where they're used all the time so her house has been really inundated with tear gas and, and flashbangs. And it's just been, um, I think any of us who have experienced it know that when a riot is called, um, it's, it's, I'm skeptical of whether or not we're meeting the definition of riot and whether there's sufficient notice being given. Um, we heard testimony about significant um, Honestly, one of the most powerful testimony was from a 15 year old who, you know, just wanted to go support the BLM movement with their friends and um, didn't go ready for battle, which a lot of folks, you know, those of us who were down there a lot knew you had to bring your watertight goggles and your gas masks and, and really um, was in an incredibly painful and scary situation with their friends. And then a young, another young woman who has asthma and also went just to support Black Lives Matter and um, had a nearly fatal asthma attack. And so clearly there's um, major um, concerns on this. Um, I'm belying a little bit of my um, prejudice on this issue to a certain degree. But what um, my experience was is my first uh, special session as a newly appointed legislature, legislator was going to our special ses session around policing. Um, and we passed a, a near complete ban on tear gas. And the, just the same week I went to a protest and was um, gassed because they declared a riot. And in that situation, there was exemptions allowing for tear gas use. And so um, the spirit of the law has not been um, followed in my mind. And so that really has been um, challenging for me to navigate because there also is real need um, for crowd control. You know, there, there is danger in crowds at times. And, and so I see the need from a, from a security and a safety standpoint to be able to control those crowds. And yet, you know, we see disproportionate use of, of those um, tools when the situation is focused on, and I'm again belying my prejudice here, but you know we have white boy rallies or certain rallies and, and things are not used and we have Black Lives Matter rallies and, and different populations of people there and, and different ones are used. And, and I would welcome anyone to push back on this because I, this is my own experience that I speak to and I'm certainly not trying to make over generalizations, but that has been my experience. Um, so, any questions or further comments on that? I don't want this to be a monologue if, if people want to talk about this. Um, you know, I, and I guess while I'm waiting for people to jump in, you know, I and you all live in a district that has a really challenging position. You know, we've got an urban core where a lot of people live and we are seeing homeless um, just families and, and individuals who are having to live on the street in a way that I personally have never seen in this city. And you add to that the um, relative chaos and disruption that we have been seeing because of um, these conflicts um, over racial justice um, movements in those areas. And um, I Feel like, and I really would love to hear from those of you who live in these areas, I feel like there's been a lot of finger pointing at the racial justice movement as being the cause of the homeless situation or vice versa. And I, I feel like there's some conflation of this and I, I don't believe that that's uh, true to what my understanding is of the issue is that 
We have people who have been put out of their jobs and don't have the means to sustain housing and are living in community where they can because there isn't, I mean, it's not safe, it's not supported, like community wherever you are is helpful. And, and so unfortunately or fortunately, people are finding that on our streets and um, we have got to get people in shelter. We have to get people housing. And I don't know how we do that in this budget situation that we find ourselves in. And yet if we can't get people in housing, I don't know what we're doing as a government. So um, that's my own personal position. And it's really challenging because the county, the city and the state all have jurisdiction on this issue. And so it's hard to find leadership because no one, no one entity has the ability to fix the problem. So I'm really gonna stop talking for a second and just have people respond because I really think this is an important conversation for our city. So Maxine, yeah, please just, just to uh, corroborate what you said, there's a couple of tents on 23rd and Marshall and every morning a young woman emerges from one of them, you know, nicely dressed and she gets on the streetcar and goes to work. So it's a, it's a housing problem. And, and, you know, I think what I've heard from some of the folks who I've um, interacted with in different ways is that the gyms being closed has really exacerbated that because a lot of our you know, housing insecure neighbors have been using gyms or YMCAs as a means for, you know, they actually pay for a gym membership so that they can use the showers and, and whatnot and then live on the streets. And so Jerry, I think that that's, you know, this is not a, a community of folks who don't want to work. This is a community of folks who have lost their security in their lives. And, and COVID has a huge um, impact in that way. That makes it harder for, for private um, neighbors to help them out too, right? If, if you have somebody in the household that's at risk, um, you're less likely to take somebody in or, or even give them access to, to some of your facilities, right? Yeah. Um, regarding what you said about um, the, the, the uh, homelessness crisis being, being put at the, or being blamed on BLM, I think that's the same as, as, uh, the the business uh, the the problems that the business community is facing in, in Portland and it's it's pretty obvious to everybody that uh, that's that they're looking for scapegoats right it's it's COVID did most of the damage I'm not I don't want to minimize it or claim that there wasn't any vandalism but uh, the lasting damage was it was and is being done by COVID in my mind. No, I think that's really an important point and thank you because yeah the business community is an enormous part of my district as well and and clearly the business community is really hurting as well. And we've lost an enormous number of our restaurants and small businesses and especially our BIPOC owned businesses and don't have access to the funds that they need to be supported. Sorry, somebody. Next, was, I was yeah. just going to say, um, I completely agree with Peter. I mean, anyone who's lived in Portland for longer than five years knows that the homelessness issue began when Charlie Hales passed the, you know, being able to put a tent on any public land. And that's when everything became, it was probably always there, but that's when it became extremely visible. And so, I mean, I think it's just absolutely abominable to try and peg BLM with the connection. It's COVID. It's the mixture of COVID and the economy and the federal government not coming in and, you know, it's, but it, it had nothing to do at all with the protests going on. So as far as I, as far as I can tell. Yeah, and I, I hear a lot about the boarded up businesses um, downtown and, and frankly, you know, if I'm a business owner and I'm concerned about something, I'll board up my windows. That doesn't mean that um, they've been shattered by BLM protesters, that it happens for sure. And I'm not in any way condoning that. I do think having been there and Peter and Vesna and all of you who've been at these protests, um, there is a very active small group of protesters who are out there to do damage to property. And um, I, I'm conflicted on whether that is um, a, a helpful endeavor. Um, you know, the police, and we can go back 
you know, to, to why the police were formed. The, the police were started to protect property, to bring property, to bring slaves back to slave owners. And that is where policing began. And that is absolutely related to why we are where we are now. And it's not about protecting people as much as property. And so when you um, damage property and exacerbate the police's unsteadiness and they overreact with use of force that is disproportionate to the act that instigated it, it proves the point that it is about property and not people. And that is really, I mean, that is something that I didn't acutely understand until I participated in these Black Lives Matter movements and saw the disproportionate reaction to property damage, um, you know, putting people in serious harm's way over, you know, a garbage can that's being lit on fire or a building that's being um, vandalized. And I'm not mitigating or, or minimizing that um, impact of that property damage. And yet, you know, what are the police doing if it's not protecting people? And so I, again, I really welcome an, a candid dialogue on this because my, my perspective is my perspective and I'm here to learn from you all too. And, and, and maybe one more thing, and I've, I've talked to many of the, the people down there um, and I cringe every time I see even some 15 year old spray painting on a, on a, on a building. But at the same time, we, well, I don't want to say we, but the politics don't listen to, to peaceful protests, right? Um, so many of the leaders are saying, no, we want this to be nonviolent, which all of them are until you get, well, the, the vast majority are nonviolent, not always peaceful, but nonviolent, right? Uh, the vast majority of the, the violence that I've seen started coming out of the federal building, uh, not, not from the uh, demonstrators. Um, but even some of the protest leaders are saying, uh, look, we, we know how this is being portrayed and it, it helps the other side to, to uh, get their narrative out. Um, at the same time, uh, we didn't even know that there were daily protests downtown while they were being peaceful. Yeah. Many people didn't know until the media shows up and they only show up when there's violence because it sells. So there are leaders even in the protest movement that say, we don't want, we don't want the violence necessarily, but nobody listens. If, if you just walk around from four to five and then disappear and you don't disrupt anything, you don't get any, any reaction either. So it's, it's, I, I don't know what the solution is. Again, I don't support the violence, but I can understand, right, that people feel, well, it's needed if we can't get, make any progress without it. Yeah, I think, you know, it's created a discomfort that has caused a reckoning. And, and you know, I think that it's important for us to be uncomfortable um, because what we have all um, been, or not all, but most of us have been pretty blind to for a long time is finally getting recognized. And so I think that this is positive. We just have to decide what we do with it. So that's what the equitable policing um, subcommittee is really working on. And, and I really respect Rep Bynum and her leadership in this regard. So um, any other last thoughts on this? Because I do want to touch on other things. And I also know that this is where a lot of us have spent a lot of time thinking. Maxine, can you just tell me when you're sitting on these committees and you're talking about, you know, the, I don't like calling it the defunding of the police, but the redistribution of funds to the police. Um, you know, how, as both you and I being clinicians, are they, are there people there speaking up, talking about how important it is to have mental health, social work, addiction services, yeah. all those things there? A hundred percent. Okay, good. hundred percent. Yeah, and I was just going to get to Bobby's um, issue around me implementing Measure 110, because these things are all just so related and interconnected. Um, and, you know, I'll also talk about my Department of Corrections activism and, and work there because this is all, you know, systemic racism. It's finally time that we're looking at this and it is the core of so many of the things that we're struggling with right now. But Measure 110 
is you know trying to reverse the impacts of um, criminalization of marijuana. Um, and Bobby, please jump in if I am not doing it justice, but by um, not allowing arrests for the possession of marijuana and shifting those dollars um, from uh, the measure um, to restoration, I think, of people and mental health supports and really trying to use substance use disorder um, therapy. Yes, yeah. yeah. it comes along with that. So basically, instead of arresting people, not, not just for marijuana, but for uh, uh, all uh, uh, small amounts of drugs yeah. uh, at the same time, uh, we want to take a health approach versus a criminal approach because just because someone has an addiction doesn't mean they're a criminal. And uh, a lot of people need services that are not available to them. Like for instance, when, when I was arrested and I expressed to the officers that, that I had a drug problem, no one offered me any assistance. No one offered me a, a, a program to go to or a recovery center to go to. No one offered anything like that to me. And there was nothing available when, I, when that happened to me. I just don't want to see the same thing happen to others like it did to me. And that's why I'm here and I really support this uh, Measure 110 and I would like to uh, move forward with uh, getting this law impl implemented. Yeah, thank you this so much. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, it's been really powerful to see all of the folks who have been so um, disarming with their stories and really authentic in their desire to just move us out of this place where we see substance use disorder as a crime. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we also know, again, like the systemic um, issues are all related, but childhood trauma and, you know, the, the, um, we know that if you are traumatized as a child, and if you have multiple um, social determinants of health that are unstable, you are much more likely to have substance use um, issues and, and criminalized over time. And then once you have one of those infractions on your record, you, you have a harder time getting a job or getting housing. And so this creates a huge um, spiral for people that they just can't get out of. And, and Bobby, to your point, you know, we're, we're treating it as a crime rather than as a disease. And it really is, you know, something that I know Vesna deals with all the time as a primary care provider. And, and I, you know, as a clinician, you know, really struggle with this. And we also know that people's pain is treated differently depending on the color of their skin and whether they're believed. So there's so many issues here. And Bobby, thank you for your work. And, and we really do um, have a long way to go, but I'm so grateful for um, this movement. Yeah, because that, that really impacted my life for, for 27 years, over two and a half decades. But uh, I, I really think about um, things like uh, the, the centers and the, the recovery centers. Everyone um, who, who will apply uh, will get access to the funds uh, for to help with harm reduction, to help with uh, 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 peer support. Uh, the, 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 when, 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 when a citation is delivered to, to someone when they're cited with the citation, they have access to get uh, help. And if they choose to get this help, it's gonna be done by professionals and peers that people are, of, of that, that have been where they've been, people who know what's going on. So, so the harm reduction, the peer support, uh, 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 all those things will be there, all those things. And, and those people can uh, use these funds as well to, to enhance what they're already doing. Okay. And we want, we, like you said, all these things are connected. All these things, and we need as a group all, all of us through Oregon, all of us need to come together and, and, and make this push to make this so. Thank and you. I thank you guys for listening and, and thank you so much, uh, Ms. Dexter. I appreciate you a lot. Oh, it's my <laughs> so, so I guess, but, but my question again is, is uh, would you support uh, the, the funding for implementation for the measure? So this is, this is an issue that we are talking a lot about. So it's not that, I don't think there's anyone that I've heard who doesn't support funding it. I think the question is how quickly we're implementing it and whether there's the structures to make sure it's implemented well. And so I do follow in a lot of ways the policy of you have to go slow to go fast to a certain degree. Sometimes when you try to get things out so fast that you end up trying to fix it, that takes more time. So. Um, you know, I think there's a balance there. And so I think that that balance is really going to be hit by, you know, the Measure 110 folks really pushing. And then we know that the bureaucracy is going to slow it down. And so somewhere in between is the balance that I think is optimal. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, no, my pleasure. So I do want to talk about um, COVID and schools and Emerson, thank you for adding that, you know, this is not a Portland problem as far as the homelessness that this is everywhere in our state and that's clearly recognized, you know, some of our rural counties are really struggling with this too and they don't have the infrastructure to support housing in some places too. So I appreciate that comment. Um, and, and Vesna also, I want to um, call out that, yeah, some of the, the violence is actually property destruction and it's hard for me to call property destruction violence, but um, agree with that point too. Um, so as far as COVID and vaccine distribution, so um, lots of focus on this, obviously. And what, you know, my, my critical point that I will continue to make is there is no equity when there is scarcity and that we do not have enough vaccine period. So when you don't have enough, there's no equitable way to distribute it, right? You're making choices um, between folks who all deserve to be protected. And so the governor and the OHA has been in an impossible situation where now we can get the vaccine out. Initially, like we had more vaccine than we could get out. The systems took care of that pretty quickly. Now we have the means for distributing the vaccine, but really have nowhere near enough. And this again puts us in this rural urban balance. And Emerson, I'd love to hear your perspective on this too, but um, our, our more our less populated counties are being able to get through the 1A groups better. And 1A are healthcare workers and, and those who are um, frontline, well, actually it's not even our frontline workers. It's really been focused on our healthcare workers um, and those who are um, at high risk within uh, developmental disabilities and other um, illness you know, predisposing conditions. And then also um, we added teachers to that recently. And that's been an area of huge um, um, conflict um, because what happens when you have too little and you put someone in the line or in the queue ahead of others that you automatically have made a judgment about who is more worthy. And so a lot of folks have been really frustrated by um, where they are in the queue. And again, there's just no equity here when we don't have enough. And so next week, um, we will start vaccinating all 80 year olds and above. And that is an important thing to do. And yet we have nowhere near enough vaccine to make that a realistic um, point of access. Um, so people will be frustrated. And we have had the OHA tell us that we need to be ready for chaos, quote unquote. And that my team, Lauren, Peter, and, and Kate are going to be making appointments for people who call in because they don't know how to navigate the OHA websites. And so, you know, we're, and I know for a fact that our healthcare teams have been overwhelmed um, at every clinic, no matter what your affiliation with, you know, Kaiser or Providence or Legacy, everyone's getting called trying to figure out how to get a vaccine because this is, it's decentralized. And that means that the communication is, is going to be different depending on where you live and, and your access to the vaccine will be different. So we're trying to do our best. And the fact of the matter is that the OHA is a policy making agency it is very good at making policy and it's very thoughtful and they've made good recommendations over the whole course of this um, pandemic to our governor, I believe, but it is not an operational group. So operationalizing COVID, vaccine distribution, testing, tracing, all those things, that is not what they were built to do. And so we have put a task on a very short timeline on an agency that doesn't have the operational sort of um, infrastructure to help do this. And as a state, our public health systems are very decentralized. They're county-based. We don't have a statewide public health infrastructure that allows us to shift um, resources where they're most needed. And so that really is a fundamental issue that I hope to address over the next, you know, I hope to be here. And if you'll all support me, I'll be here for a while so that I can continue to work on the public health infrastructure because the silos that we have have really gotten in the way 
right now. And um, my vision is that, you know, the state has the ability to help coordinate and support without micromanaging um, counties. You know, there is differences in every region of the state and what the needs are, are important to be locally facilitated and controlled. And yet there has to be an overarching means for um, facilitating um, public health uh, uh, resource utilization and, and movements, you know, as they come up, whether it's clean air, clean water, or COVID. So the vaccines, um, I'll just put in a plug for my committee. I am the um, chair of the COVID-19 subcommittee of, from healthcare. Mondays and Wednesdays from 3.15 to 5, we meet. If you go, if you put in OLIS in Google, it's going to come up it's Oregon Legislative Information System, and you can look up House committees and you can find the link. You can watch our committee. We take testimony almost every um, meeting from the public. So Monday's topic is um, our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities mm -hmm. who are trying to access vaccines and how is that going and, and what is vaccine hesitancy and, and how do we help um, support these marginalized communities who aren't getting vaccine in the same way, especially those who don't speak English? Um, so, or don't, English is not their first language or they don't have access to the internet. So um, I'll stop talking. I'd love to hear some feedback on what people think. Yeah, Vesna. So I just wanna say, because you can't say it um, and you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, what I've preached to my patients for months now is that it, you're right. It, we, we can't place all the blame in the fact that we didn't have a good structure set up public health wise in Oregon, because they're not the ones that distributed the polio virus and the H1N1 virus. And this is a CDC matter. This is a federal matter. <laughs> and it should have happened as like a wave coming in and a wave leaving, you know, everyone gets vaccinated, everyone does it. And we now know with utter clarity the docs already knew it, by the way, but we all knew with, uh, know with other clear with utter clarity that there was a zero CDC involvement in making a plan, and it was the Trump administration that did not that got us out of the WHO for testing, and then basically didn't stockpile vaccine. So, I do think that we always need to have a good plan in place, but let's call a spade a spade. And the reason why it's been a forgive my French hit show is because we didn't have a CDC. So I apologize, Maxine, for swearing on your site, but I'm, you, you can't say this, but I'll say it. So there you go. Thank you. Emerson, I see oh, your hand up. Thank yeah. you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Vesna. I apologize, Maxine, mm -hmm. but thank you, Vesna. That's the word I've been using for this. Um, on the operationalizing the, the program, I read that up in Washington, they went out to people like Costco, Starbucks. Here we have Intel. We have huge companies who absolutely know how to operationalize this. I think that if you ask them, they would absolutely raise their hands and say, we'll do whatever we can to help. And so part of my frustration has been, why doesn't the governor listen to the CDC? I agree with Vesna that they were absent. They're back. You know, they are coming out with policy, but apparently our governor doesn't believe that they're sending out the right policy. That for one thing is so frustrating. So one, operationalize it. The second, and go out and ask for help if you can't do it. I agree, the OHA doesn't know how to do this. And so ask for help, people will help you. And as far as the seniors uh, making appointments, if you go to a high school and ask the seniors or the juniors, if they would be willing to help you help seniors, they're all in. And in my neighbor's Northwest, there's a young junior who says, I'm here. I'll help anybody who needs it. And again, reach out for help. There's people who will absolutely do it and you can move much quicker. No, thank you. So there are lots of ways to allocate vaccines and um, I will just really, emphasize the fact that there's no right way right now because there hasn't been a centralized plan that we're all implementing in a reliable way. So that would have been the best plan. That's not what we have to the business point. Um, and there are, you know, Amazon and Starbucks and different private industry sectors that are doing it in Washington, we have actually been able to be pretty successful getting the vaccine in mass vaccination ways to, um, 
urban areas and even in our more rural counties getting out. The problem that we have is reaching our BIPOC communities and those who are transportationally challenged. You know, we have low income folks who can't get to the convention center. It takes them four hours by bus from outer Gresham to get to, you know, this convention center and they work. You know, you can't leave to take a four hour bus ride there and back to, and it could be longer than that with transfers. So um, we are not serving our low income and non-English speaking or, or English language learner populations well. And so, you know, Starbucks and, and, you know, Amazon aren't necessarily going to get to those communities. What we do know is if you start with workplaces, to your point, you start with workplaces and you start vaccinating the lowest wage earners, you will get to those communities and in, in a lot of ways and you can vaccinate them where they work. And that is a, a policy that we are going to be trying to support. And Nike's already talking to us, Intel's talking to us like this is as we get to frontline workers, that is going to start happening, I believe. But we aren't to the place where we're even vaccinating frontline workers yet. You know, that's not really the movement that we're at because we don't have the vaccine supply for it. I'm hopeful the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is going to allow for that. We'll see. Um, I, I don't want to run out of time without kind of talking about something that's really been um, taking up a huge amount of my thoughts this weekend or this week. Um, we had a conduct hearing about one of my colleagues yeah. and behavior in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and this has been an agonizing and really hard week for us. So Representative Diego Hernandez um, had, there's a rule, it's rule 27 that um, promotes and protects a safe har harassment free workplace in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And there were 13 individuals originally who had come forward saying that there had been harassment in the workplace and five of them kind of sustained through this long, grueling, months long, nine months long process. And uh, the findings of the committee were on discussion throughout this week. And it was really hard to hear um, for anyone. And you know, the statistics show that at least two thirds of the women here have been, um, or close to that, um, have been victims of harassment and oftentimes sexual harassment. Um, this was a real traumatic week for those of us who have been through that. And so can you imagine what those women have gone through to um, sustain the commitment to having this in a public forum for months, like their courage and their ability to, to be resilient in this is something I really want to elevate. Um, because they were not um, heard in the way that we should uh, hear them and, and it wasn't dealt with in the way that it should be dealt with. Um, that all being said, this has been going on for probably as long as the Oregon legislature has been um, convening. Um, Representative Tana Sanchez spoke to this as did um, several other people uh, in different forums in the last few days that sexual harassment and um, the marginalization of people of color and women in our capital is something that's been, you know, decades, um, if not longer, um, present. And so it's really unfortunate that the first person that we hold to this rule is a man of color. And it makes you question, you know, the process, our commitment to upholding a, a harassment-free workplace. And I just hope and, and I pledge to you all that I will hold all of my colleagues accountable to the same standard. And I did support um, the finding that, um, that they recommend expulsion for Representative Hernandez. Um, and I think it's not, it's important to acknowledge that we also have Representative Nierman who will also go through this process. And um, his Republican colleagues, you know, voted for this to be heard on the floor um, as an expulsion hearing. And, and everyone understands um, that that same standard is going to need to be the lens with which we look at um, Rep Nierman's actions. So it's a really awful and yet important. And I think, um, pivotal time for our legislature. And so I, I love comments. Um, I'm not trying to put anybody under the bus. I think this is really complicated. 
Mm -hmm. And Rep Hernandez's behavior was unacceptable. And yet I think, again, systemic racism has really played a role in why he's the first man who's been held to the standard. Please, Chris. Oh, I thought, Chris, you wanted to say something, sorry. Okay. Okay. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Um, what else should we talk on? On that really light note. Um, yes, please, Linda. I know that you have been um, interested in and supporting some air quality bills related to smoke and other things. And I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about those, please. Yes. So um, when I, there's something called a bill back that you used to walk around with your physical bill written on a piece of paper and on the back of the bill were the lines next to each representative's name that where they put their signature or their initials so that you could sign them on as co-sponsors. And we had one day where we actually had, we're all in the building together and I was trying to get some people to sign my bill backs on this bill. And, and it was clear. Um, so I, I have a couple air quality related bills, but the major one that's gonna be the heaviest lift is called an indirect sources um, air quality bill. And what that is, and anyway, so I couldn't, <laughs> not many people wanted to sign that bill back because they knew how uh, loaded this conversation is gonna be. So. Um, what it is effectively is um, currently we have on street clean diesel um, measures that were passed in 2019 and, it, and are present in the Portland metro area that are, are quite good, um, you know, really looking at more um, efficient uh, trans or, um, Anyway, less carbon emissions from, I'm gonna belie that I'm not really an engineer by trade. And, and I was thinking of what Peter was thinking as I was trying to explain why carbon comes out of a diesel engine. Anyway, um, the, the reality is that diesel fumes have particulate matter that cause health um, issues most importantly, asthma, COPD, in urban areas, we know that there's higher degrees of chronic um, lung diseases. And they, the air quality is um, impactful, not just for asthma and COPD, but vascular issues. So we're talking about um, strokes and heart attacks. These all go up and it, it's a, an impressive um, relationship with particulate matter in the air. That same day you have increased heart attacks and strokes in the area where you see those um, particulate matters. And it's a, it's highly, highly um, inflammatory. And so that's what happens. You inhale it, causes inflammation and people um, either get their asthma exacerbation, their COPD exacerbation or um, strokes and, and heart attacks. So um, what we're trying to do in this district, House District 33 has the worst air quality in the city. And I showed my committee when we were talking about this the other day that you just look out of my window and you look over the industrial district and we live on a hill. And so, you know, coming up from the industrial district, you can smell the burning um, chemicals and plastics and all those things. And if you can smell it in the air, you're inhaling it. And so no matter what it is, if you can smell it, even you know, perfumes and different things, those, that is particulate microparticulate matter that you are inhaling and, and it is inflammatory. So anyway, I've gone way off um, a little bit because this is something I care a lot about, but the indirect sources bill is one where we're looking to regulate the particulate emissions, diesel emissions from non-street um, emitters. So we're talking mostly about rail yards, um, the ports and construction um, sites. And the major one in our, 80% of it is going to be from these three sources plus airports. Um, and we wanna regulate it. And no one who's in the construction industry wants us to regulate it or the house builder, you know, I am not gonna say the house builders, they haven't talked to me about this bill yet, but, um, Construction vehicles are old. They last a long time. The diesel engines don't need to be um, replaced very often. And they are highly inefficient and they burn a lot of diesel and it all um, gets into our air. And so we are trying to regulate this and it's gonna cost a huge amount of money for these industries to you know, replace the train engines and replace the ship engines and all of these things. 
Um, so there's a huge pushback on it. And yet, like, we can't do much better. We can a little bit, but we, we're um, rearranging, you know, microparticulate changes with further reductions in street traffic. It's got it. We've got to go to these indirect sources to make an impact on our air quality. So um, this is my major environmental bill, and it's not one that has been elevated very much yet because um, I think OLCV and other groups just are like, this one's too big and this is not our priority. We want 100% clean energy to be our priority. And I, I think that makes sense. And yet I will continue to bring this one back until we get it done. So I'm gonna work on it and I'd love your guys' support and I'd love the advocacy from this group. Um, and yet my, the reality is this is not a top priority for the environmental community right now. And so it's probably not gonna get done without their lifting it with me. A it's a lot less visible. The, uh, bill number. Okay. Yes, Lauren, what's the bill number? Here, let me pull it up really quick. 2814. Thank you. Oh, it's already in the chat. Look at you. Sorry, or Peter already put it in there. My team's ahead of me there. Um, so yes, I would love for people to help me out with that one. Any last thoughts? We're getting close to the close. To yeah, just just on that comment, um, I, I think obviously EVs are a lot more visible and and cars in everybody's driveway. But if you look at where you can really make a difference, it's with vehicles that are on the road every day, all day, right? Public transportation, uh, postal service, and then trucks. And and I I see the difficulty. It's it's probably much more easily addressed at the federal level, and I hope that the new administration will go after that. Uh, but it's definitely something we need to we need to go after with the biggest biggest uh, problem in my mind that we can address is infrastructure charging infrastructure in particular right if if it's there and we can efficiently charge garbage trucks same thing right um, they, they don't cover huge distances constant stop and start and stop which is is uh, way more inefficient than even a, a regular car going down the highway um but we need to figure out a way to charge them and and then transition to to electric no 100 percent. i think we just had our first um electric school buses in oregon um, start circulating this week so we're we're starting but you know this is this is where the 100 percent clean energy movement and really investing in a green economy is where we can build the infrastructure and start the movement here in oregon and it's to our advantage economically to start doing that um, proactively now. So I, I agree with you, the federal movement is needed, but if we can get ahead of that movement and start building the jobs and the infrastructure here, it's actually to our state's advantage to, to kind of be you know, established when this really explodes. It's Absolutely, I, I think, I mean, you can't build too many batteries, honestly, you, you look at how Amazon is trying to, con, uh, to to transition their delivery trucks. They just got the first Rivian trucks on the road now, um, and it's mostly limited by by nobody being able to build all the batteries we'll need. Yeah. Um, well, it is 10 o'clock or a minute after, I think. Um, I'm really grateful. I do want to mind everyone's time. We do this every two weeks. So hopefully um, you will. Thank you. Um, hopefully everyone will come back and I will send out a, a newsletter every other Friday on the weeks we don't have a copy. So if you haven't um, signed up for my newsletter, uh, please do. Lauren dropped in the chat our email. You can just email us and we'll add you there. So all represent or all legislators have either rep dot or sen for senator dot their full name at OregonLegislature.gov. Super long, but you know how to find any of us with that if you know our names. Um, so email me, get on my list. Please advocate for the bills you care about. OLIS is actually a really helpful website that if you go to OLIS, and put in, even if you just want environment um, bills, you can put in under bill lookup by um, text. You can put the word that you care about and it'll give you the list of all the bills and you can sign up for reports on when there's gonna be a public hearing, when there's gonna be discussion in committee or a work session. So um, please do that because we need public testimony to help us know where we are being headed. You know, where, How do we represent you most effectively? So 
continue to work with us and I will do everything I can to represent you and I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. <laughs>